Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Necessity of Tomorrows, featuring Tarana Burke and Nadia Tolokonikova, moderated tonight by Jenna Wortham. I'm your host, Kim Brown. We'd like to welcome all of our friends who are watching us tonight on Facebook Live, on the Baltimore Museum of Arts YouTube channel, and at bmatomorrows.org. So before we begin tonight's dynamic conversation, we're gonna start with a special performance from Jojo Abbott, which is in part inspired by tonight's program and the Baltimore Museum of Arts 2020 Vision Initiative, celebrating female identifying artists. So who is Jojo Abbott? She is a nomadic interdisciplinary artist and musician. She's toured with Miss Lauren Hill. She's also performed at festivals and venues like Afropunk, The Roots Picnic, Radio City Music Hall, the Apollo Theater, and the Kennedy Center. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here's Jojo Abbott. to be here with you beautiful people tonight. I hope you're feeling power. I hope you're feeling alive. I hope you're feeling the love. This is all for you. Trust of the days when your presence burned me. Freedom 
my mind to the tell Now dare me Cause I'd be down If my children were to repeat The struggle for so-called freedom That distracts me performance there from Jojo Abbott. Thank you so much. Now it's time to introduce Asma Naheem. Asma is the Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown Chief Curator at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And since joining the BMA just two years ago, Asma has led a team of curators to conceive and realize the museum's ambitious program of 25 exhibitions celebrating the accomplishments of female identifying artists as part of the BMA's 2020 Vision Initiative. Asma is also the curator of Candace Bright's Too Long Didn't Read on view through January 10th, 2021, and co-curator of Valerie Maynard, Lost and Found on view through January 3rd. Her recent book is titled Out of Earshot, Sound, Technology, and Class in American Art, 1847 to 1897, and that's published by the University of California Berkeley Press. And in her book, Asma urges scholars to think in nuanced and expansive ways about the relations between the visual arts, sound technologies, and sensory experience. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Chief Curator Asma Naheem to the screen. Hello, Asma. Hi, Kim. Thanks for that kind introduction and with that amazing voice of yours. The evening's just begun and we're already off to such an incredible start with an incredible vibe. Hi, everybody out there. Thanks for joining us this evening. Well, here we are a century after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave white women the right to vote. Women are still undervalued, underrecognized, and underpaid in nearly every facet of our society. While the BMA's 2020 Vision Initiative celebrates the extraordinary achievements of female identifying artists, it also acknowledges that most museums are deficient in exhibiting and acquiring their work, and we're setting out to change that. The museum is very proud to present the work of an incredibly diverse and talented group of contemporary artists, Candice Brights, Zachary Drucker, Valerie Maynard, Anna Mendieta, Alyssa Blount Moorhead, Joe Smale, Shanique Smith, Howardina Pindell, Shan Wallace, and four quilters from G's Bend, Alabama, Lucy Mingo, Loretta Petway, Curly Irby Petway, and Nell Hall Williams. The museum is also displaying works by Lakota women, 
who created subversive beadworks to preserve their heritage and protect their families. We also have on view a show honoring the legacy of one of the greatest female directors in this museum's history, Adeline Breeskin. And we've begun expanding the museum's collection with major works by Barbara Chase Rabeau, Suzanne Jackson, Wendy Redstar, Martine Sims, and many others, and there's many more to come. The Necessity of Tomorrow's Speaker Series borrows its title from an essay by science fiction author Samuel Delaney. Delaney argues for the role of creative speculation in making a more just future. Since 2017, the BMA has hosted a variety of acclaimed creators and thinkers under this mantle, including Mark Bradford, Ta-Nehisi Coates, and Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm very pleased tonight to present three inspiring women, Tarana Burke and Nadia Tola Konikova, are joining us this evening. The works and lives of these two extraordinary women firmly represents the ideals of a just future. Tarana is best known for creating the Me Too movement. She has dedicated her life to social justice work and giving strength to those who experience sexual trauma, abuse, or harassment. Among the many accolades Tarana has received for this work are the 2017 Person of the Year, along with other silence breakers from Time Magazine and Australia's 2019 Sydney Peace Prize. Many are not aware that Tarana has also developed programs for several organizations, including the National Voting Rights Museum and Institute in Alabama and the Art Sanctuary in Philadelphia to build community engagement through art. Nadia is an artist, political activist, and founding member of the feminist protest art collective Pussy Riot, one of the world's most prominent activist art groups in recent years. Pussy Riot has brought attention to human rights violations in Russia and abroad, and were named among the 100 women of the world by Time Magazine in 2012. Our moderator this evening is the inimitable Jenna Workman, a writer for the New York Times Magazine and co-host of the newspaper's podcast, Still Processing. Jenna is also the co-editor of the forthcoming anthology, Black Futures, with Kimberly Drew. She's an herbalist as well, and a community care worker oriented towards justice and liberation. We're so grateful to have these three inspiring women joining us this evening. The BMA is most fortunate to have this event funded through the legacy of our former board chair, Suzanne F. Cohen, and the Cohen Opportunity Fund. We dedicate this evening in honor of Sue for her dual passions for art and social justice and for especially advancing the rights of women. Now I'll turn the program over to Jenna Wortham. Thank you, Usma, and thank you, Kim. Uh, my name is Jenna Wortham, and it is such an honor to be here in such exquisite company. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be a part of this event for Baltimore and the Baltimore Museum of Art. I have family in Baltimore, a lot of good friends hail from there and live there. And I always love an opportunity to rep the city. So thank you for having me. Um, good evening to everyone who tuned in tonight. Grateful to have you. Um, I'm sure you're as eager and as excited as I am to hear from our panelists this evening. Um, I'll be moderating the discussion for about an hour with Tarana and Nadia. And we'll also have room at the end for questions from the audience. So we want to invite you to submit your questions through both Facebook Live and YouTube or the program's website. And don't hold back and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Okay. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you both. Um, you know, I-, I talk to you. What was that? I said, I'm excited to talk to you. Thank you. Um, well, one thing that's on my mind is, you know, this event was originally scheduled for the spring, and like so many other things was put on ice and delayed for a little while. Now it's almost November. I'm, I'm so curious to hear from you both about what you've been reflecting on these last couple of months. <sighs> I don't know that I've given myself enough time for reflection in the last couple of months. Uh, if I'm being honest, I think that uh, I would probably do some reflecting 
these last few months about just how much has happened in the past 10 months. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's just, even when I think a little bit about taking it, somebody asked me the other day about Sundance and I was like, last year? <laughs> All right, then we did go to Sundance. I forgot that there was like, a, you know, our regular lives at some point this year. So I don't know that I've done enough reflecting. I think I've been thinking, doing a lot of forward thinking I'm uh, thinking a lot about 2021, thinking a lot about what the future holds and just the things that I want, the lessons that I have been learning this year and how I want to bring those, you know, like, like change my life this way generally, not just because of a pandemic or, mm. um, or a situation. So that, that's kind of where my mind is. It's just like, okay, it's time to really think about like with some intention who I want to be, how I want to be, how I want to show up in the world, how I want people around me, like that kind of thing. Um, first of all, I want to tell you both that it's a great pleasure to speak with you today. Mm-hmm. And thank you for joining. I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, if we talk about my last two months, well, I've been reflecting about the future as well, where, um, but also about things that uh, this global pandemic made us, I think, all think about, about uh, you know, um, how accessible is um, hum- the, the simple human stuff like healthcare for us about inequality and why pandemic affects one people much more than other groups of people. And, um, and, I would not say that this year was a positive experience because we've seen a lot of deaths, but it was a useful experience in a way that it made us stop and really reflect on issues like inequality, injustice, and racism. And I feel like this year was really awesome for inspiring people's political imagination because I've never saw so many projections in the future as I saw from activists from various parts of the world um, about how 2021 will look like, how 2050 will look like. Because before I felt uh, we've been trapped in this 24 hours news cycle and we would talk just about, I don't know, how Donald Trump farted today. And (laughs) and I'm welcoming all these discussions about, you know, the future of public safety, like, do we need so much police on the streets? Should we just uh, defund the police and give uh, the money and power to someone else, to social workers who are much more equipped to do um, their job? So um, I'm kind of um, depressed by this year with just, you know, the amount of tragic uh, things that it brought, but also I'm mesmerized because it gives us interesting perspectives about the future. Mm, mm. That makes me wonder, I mean, how do we make space to future dream and look ahead when the present feels so precarious? How how are you finding that balance, like making that space to project outward while we're so day to day in the uncertainty? I think that's why I haven't been able to look back because I think that for me, the looking forward is the part that makes me feel hopeful because this mm. the day-to-day is so can feel I, I actually this year has been interesting because there's so much tragedy that has happened but it hasn't been a terrible year like there's been all some really great things that have happened too but it just feels uncomfortable to celebrate when there's so much tragedy around you I think but yeah I think the the looking forward has been what's giving me given me some hope and and also to see the way that people, I mean, I know our folks are resilient and just, you know, I get that. And I've seen it a whole bunch of different times in different ways, but it doesn't, every single time it's invigorating. Every single time you watch people um, just bounce back and figure out new ways to bounce back. And this generation in particular, I mean, young people like the, I forgot, I don't know what they call Gen Z Zennials or my daughter is somewhere in between there, but that the like 20 somethings and, and younger are, are, they're so phenomenal. Like, I know it sounds very old and auntie, but like the young people give me strength, but, but they, they just, they, they make me feel less scared about the future. They make me feel like 
we have done some things right, although we've got, you know, we messed up the plan and we got a lot of stuff wrong, but so I like watching them. I like watching how they move. I like, you know, following their lead to some extent around, um, because their resilience is um, a different kind to me. I feel like we, when we were resilient and through a certain tragedies, my generation, I mean, it was with a burden, if you will. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you just gotta be a martyr all the time. And you have to carry this burden and there was no joy infused in it. And I think these young people are like, you know, twerking their way to the future. And it's just, it's just so dope. <laughs> like, I'm like, I, I want to do what they do, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I love it. Do you want to add anything, Nadia? Um, yeah, um, I, I mm -hmm. really share your celebration of the young people. And I want to point out, especially at because I'm from Russia, the amazing young people in Russia. For us, the last 10 years uh, have been a big step in terms of development of feminism and uh, LGBTQ plus issues. Uh -huh. And when we started in the end of 2011, when we started the band, the movement, um, it was totally uncomfortable to be a feminist. So if you would call yourself an activist or a feminist, it, equal, it will equals being a freak. And I was willing to be that freak. <laughs> I was fine, mm -hmm. with it. but today it's much more comfortable. And so that's why feminism and LGBTQ um, made this breakthrough into mainstream um, in a lot of ways because of because of the young generation and because of them sharing the same space with uh, you know young people from your country. They're all uh, sharing uh, time in the same TikTok and. Mm -hmm. So today in 2020, it's really fashionable. I would not fear this word. It's fashionable to be an activist. And I, I'm, really, uh, I'm really happy about that because when we started uh, our activism, we were dreaming about that, but uh, we wanted to bring, we, we form, formulated our goals clearly as bringing joy back to the protest action. Mm -hmm. Because I totally know what you mean. Um, 10 years ago, protest was like a boring duty or I mean, not necessarily boring, but did the duty martyrdom, right? Um, today it has changed so much. And I feel yeah. so proud that it looks like Pusherai brought a little bit, um, you know, that we influenced somehow this change. Yeah. And generally speaking about the future, I, um, I think we, the people, we have to take back this conversation about the future from governments and big business and corporations and ultra rich people. Um, in the beginning of this lockdown, I posted um, a number of books that I was recommending people to read on the current end. And uh, there were a lot of books about the future. And I got a lot of comments like, what do you think about that? Like, you're not a rich person, like you're not living in Silicon Valley. It's not like we have to deal with the issues right here in front of us. And I think while we have to deal with issues right here in front of us, if we don't own this conversation about the future and visions of the future and just give it away to Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whoever else, um, then, uh, you know, the, the, the better future will not come. Mm. I, I love that you both are bringing up the importance of joy. And I think sometimes, you know, when we hear that, it, it, it sounds like we're prioritizing joy above all else as though joy can't live alongside resistance. It can't live alongside right. activism. It can't live alongside these urgent means of work as well. And I guess I'm curious to hear you both reflect on the ways in which you found joy in doing movement work and the potentials for the, the joy and resistance to work in tandem. Because I, I, I do think what you're both speaking to is so powerful. And we've seen the images of people dancing in the street during the uprisings, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they're not grieving and upset, but they're finding space right. for this other expression as well. Yeah, I think that's precisely it. And I think for, in my work in particular, dealing with survivors of sexual violence, joy is a part of the work. It's mm -hmm. joy is resistance, right? It is, it is, finding, helping survivors tap into the ability to, to um, hold joy 
is a big part of the healing process. And it is also a part of what activates them to want to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so it, they have to work alongside each other. It's not like, let's stop now and take some time out for, to, to be joyful, right? I mean, you know, however you work it into your life and however people um, find ways to be joyful outside of it, it's, that's great. But I also think that's why we have, um, we use, as my a friend of mine used to have the tagline of the organization, culture as a weapon. It's, it, it is expressions of culture, expressions of art and culture are also bring joy and can be used for resistance. Um, bodily expressions of, that can bring joy and can be you know, expressions of resistance. So if it's a whole team of young people who have locked arms and they are doing the, whatever the dance is down, down the block, but they're not letting the police come through, right? There's a, there's a, that's very literal, but there's a combination of things happening. They're doing that and having fun. They may be scared as well, but that added, that addition of both the community and the joy helps them through that. And so I, I am a huge proponent, I think, Joy is um, highly prioritized in my work because I, it is one of the biggest tools in our arsenal to move the work forward. Mm. Um, I personally feel if um, your activism is not bringing you joy, then it's not likely that it's going to last for a long time because you can suffer for a year or two or three or even five, but then later you will end up choosing something else. Right. So instead of that, I'm trying to find a way of activism that's suitable for me. And at this, this one, this is thing that I like to talk with young activists a lot. Sometimes they feel like they have to conform to certain ways how activism, activists should act, how should they look, how should they talk. And sometimes it's not suitable for your own personality. It does not bring you joy personally. So uh, at some point of my life, when I was a young, really young activist, I was a teenager, I, I was thinking I should be a journalist or I should be um, a politician. And it required a lot of um, a lot of communication with people and then I realized that I'm introvert and I felt so bad about myself until I found art which is a great tool and you don't have to communicate with people all the time but you still can amplify your voice and voices of your voice of your community um, to a great level so and when I think about joy in protest I always think about 1968 and the whole civil rights movement. And I've been talking with some people who witnessed that and they told me exactly this. So they knew how to combine joy and the protest. That's why, uh, that's why this combination of joy and activism brought them great results and made, them, uh, made the movement really sustainable. Mm, thank you both for that. Um, you know, we're, we're in such an interesting moment right now because so much of our work is relegated to an online sphere and we're seeing such interesting interplay between activists, performers and artists because of social media. And Tarana, I was thinking about something you said in an interview not long ago about, um, you know, that hashtags themselves aren't movements, they amplify movements. And I've been thinking, that, that struck me when I read it, um, however long ago that was, but I've been really thinking about that um, now as we're in this moment where everything is happening digitally. And so I'm curious to hear you both um, expand on, you know, the idea of how movements, I guess, work now, or has our notion of what a movement is evolved or shifted at all because of the conditions we're, we're, we're operating under now for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I, I get people ask me about that line a lot. <laughs> and I do I think in some ways it's, there's some generational stuff there, right? Because <laughs> and, and I and that was I didn't I didn't say that to um, to invalidate, you know, folks who do work on the internet. In fact, one of the things I think that's really, really not good that 
that movement people do is we will, you know, to call people, oh, you're just a Twitter activist or, you know, you're just an online da 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 And I think all of that is important. If, if you are a person who just retweets, you know, information about the movement or posts IG posts, that's all you are, in, you are um, influencing your sphere. It's your sphere of influence and you're giving them direct information. But I think that one of the things I've learned in the last three years as a person who's been doing this work for a long, like since a teenager is that the general population doesn't really understand what movements are. And, and so, you know, movements are long, they are strategic and they involve pe like multiple people doing multiple things and multiple interventions. And so I think sometimes when, the, the reason why I talked about that is that because people look at the Me Too hashtag or the such and such or Black Lives Matter hashtag, right? And think, and they ask questions like, well, what's next? Like we did the hashtag. I'm like, no, no, that, that's not, it's not the thing, <laughs> right? That's the thing that points to the thing. Mm -hmm. And so while a part of the movement will take place online, the hashtag itself is not a movement. Creating a hashtag and putting it out in the world is not a movement. It creates conversation, it amplifies an issue, but I do think we have to be, um, that's not to say that movement work can't happen online, though, right? I think those are two different things. And so I just, I just think we have to be careful about the way we label things movements, right? It's just, it almost waters down the idea of what a movement is, right? You think about a, the civil rights movement or the black power movement, there are multiple people through organizations and individuals who were, who had strategy and moved that strategy forward, you know, and, and, and like there's a whole, a whole lot that goes into it. This is not just a bunch of folks writing stuff on the internet and leaving it at that. If you don't have boots on the ground in some way, even digital boots, it is, I, I just don't think you can qualify it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think just, I'll say this last thing, in this moment after, um, you know, with having a pandemic and an uprising happen at the same time, I watched that very closely, right? I watched what was happening very closely. I got, it was, it was sort of at the height of COVID too. So my, you know, my nerves were really bad about being out in the world amongst a bunch of people, sometimes with masks, sometimes without. But I also knew that that energy was spilling over and people could not hold it inside their homes. They could not, they could, posting about it wasn't gonna be enough and people had to take to the streets. And I think that is also indicative of movement. You want to move, right? You want to feel like you are in it, you're involved in it. You want to, you know, be a part of something. The marching through the street is still only a part of the movement. You know, the posting online is still only a part of the movement. When you pull all these different pieces together, then you have a, bigger, a better picture of what's happening. Um, but yeah, that's just, those are just my thoughts about that. Um. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, by the way, for wonderful questions. And Tarana, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's such a pleasure to hear you. And yeah, so um, um, digital tools for activism. When I think about um, digital tools that we can use for activism, I think about something that I call um, internet hygiene, if it makes sense. Um, because it's really easy uh, to let internet use you, um, especially social media. Uh, but the, the thing about social uh, social media hygiene is to um, force them to obey and actually use them instead of say dynamic the other way. So I believe that if we are all gonna talk more about you know how to consciously consciously use these tools, they have an amazing possibility. And I see it on the example of my country, where um, all the mainstream media are government owned or government controlled. And um, they just um, show really stupid, crazy propaganda against all the activists. And um, they're not showing, I mean, it's like, it's, it's real fake news. So, um, but we are seeing that uh, people in Russia, they are changing their media consumption. So they're going on the internet, not just to watch memes. I mean, some memes are political too, but <laughs> so they're going on internet, not just for entertainment, but 
uh, for reading news about what's happening. So I think if we are conscious about how we use it, internet can be a great, great tool for uh, building movements and uh, initiating a revolution. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I talk too much. But, but I just, I think that in terms of the generation thing I was saying, one of the things that's been fascinating for me to watch is how social media um, added this element to building movement that we didn't see, I definitely didn't see growing up. And I was just telling uh, somebody else, I was just talking about this, about um, Tyrone Davis, the, the black man who was executed in Georgia in like 2012, I think. I remember very distinctly that case being where I saw this emergence of organizing online and thought to myself, oh, this is, this is different because I, you know, I remember the thing I remembered before that was like Genesis, which I forget what year that was, but certainly before the boom of internet. And we were organizing nationally to get people to come to Louisiana by fax, by phone call, you know, by email, trying to get people to cut. There was no mechanism that, that, that you could just post something and people would see it from all over and respond to it. And so again, I don't want to undermine in any way the power of social media, the positive power of social media as a tool for building movements. Um, I just don't think they live, they can live completely on, you know, online, unless it's an online, like about something online, like digital something or other, like cybersecurity and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's fascinating to watch how one person with a certain amount of followers can say, in fact, it happened to me during the Kavanaugh hearing. I put out a call. These, these national organizations came together and said, can you put out a call for people to walk out of work on Monday? And I thought, I don't, I don't even like to. And I was like, all right, you know, everybody, blah, 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 blah. And then there's a flood of people. And I was like, oh, look at that. <laughs> this is amazing, you know. That's, that part is just you cannot even count the value. I appreciate that. And, and I, I definitely don't think you're undermining the power of social media at all. I think, you know, that I'm, I'm so drawn to that line because I think we're still learning so much about how to make things work together in new ways. And we're learning about how to drive attention to from online to offline and mm -hmm. try to also educate people about how movements do work and what activism mm -hmm. is. And I, I think we've, we've come to realize, especially in this country, yeah, most people don't understand that these are not issues or problems that get solved overnight, that these are, right. these are the work yeah. of lifetimes. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, but we have seen also such an interesting, I guess, yeah, confluence of digital tools and internet hygiene and um, also watching people in a pandemic see the power of gathering and the power of, of congregating and the power of protesting in public too. And I guess I'm wondering if, um, has there been anything new that we've learned about organizing or movement building um, structures or systems that from, from this particular window of time, these last eight months that feels really essential to hold on to when one day we come out of, of a pandemic with any luck? Yeah, I think I'm still thinking of, about that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that has been, you know, I remember when in movement circles, the idea of defunding the police was a, was c coming into the conversation, right? People started mm -hmm. talking about that as, as strategy and that's, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And it was so radical. <laughs> and so for some people, you know, far left that, you know, there would be, in fighting about that's too much you can't put that you know you got to take people slowly and watching defund the police become a rallying cry mm. in this moment was fascinating to me and there's also a lesson that I one of the things that I think that I and, I'm, and I think this is a lesson I've actually picked up over the last three years since, since the viral Me Too moment too is that we those of us who are movement leaders, movement followers, movement folks who believe in justice, who are working towards liberation. I don't, I think that there's some way, some of us um, don't dream big enough, right? We don't, we don't sort of 
dream into our visions. Mm. We don't like, like live into our vision. So we talk our vision and then we limit ourselves in practice. And as opposed to just getting it out there and, and allowing it to, you know, allowing it to build, build community around it. There's always going to be some community, even if it's a small one, there's always going to be some community around it. And so I've watched people, and that's another thing I think I picked up from young people, that they throw all of it against the wall. And I think that's okay, because there's also this idea that if you are in movement or if you are in, you know, working towards liberation, that you have all the answers, that, it, that your work is perfect, right? And you are some moral authority in some way. No, we have to have people who are making mistakes. And we have to create space to not just fail publicly. I, I don't want to say just fail, but like to grapple publicly. We don't, what, one of the lessons that I would love to take back, take back, I'm going back to the future, that I, would, that I would like to move forward with, like to see carry forward is this way that, you know, um, there's all the debate about like cancel culture and all that kind of stuff. But there's also this growing trend of allowing people to, to grapple with things that you should grapple with publicly. We should have public discourse um, respectful public discourse about things we don't agree with and about, you know, we're, if we're all ultimately heading towards the same thing or want the same thing, but we have different visions on how to get there, we should grapple with that publicly and what that means. If one person is doing a thing, we're not sure this, you, you're not, you don't really understand how this will lead us, you know, move forward our, our liberation vision. We should talk about that more publicly and grapple with that and have grace for folks to do that. So it's not um, or if somebody doesn't live up to your expectation of what this leader should do or this person who believes this should not act like this, kind of what you were talking about, Nadia, earlier, we have to have space for the fullness of our humanity because there's, there's a way that we talk about liberation, but we don't value liberation, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about it, but then we talk about liberation and then we, at the same time, we provide constraints. I want us to be free. I want all black people to be free. I want all queer people to be free, da, 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 da. But don't act like this. <laughs> and don't show up like this. And don't not agree with me this many ways, right? And, and, and I love that I think this generation is breaking a lot of that down and moving away and saying, I will show up this way. I will make mistakes out loud. I will be fully human. And I will still be fighting towards liberation. And that, that I pray that continues, because I, I think, this pandemic has got people like, whatever, okay. I mean, forget it, I'll try everything, right? I, I'll try that too. So I, I, I hope that's a trend that grows into the future. Mm -hmm. um, I loved what you said about um, making mistakes. I personally always took proud in owning my mistakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I love when people are admitting their mistakes and I love when they're of uh, being forgiving for mistakes. We had um, um, we had an event this year. Uh, there was a um, there is a TV Russian TV anchor. Uh, her name is Regina Todarenka, and uh, she was not a feminist before. More than that, uh, she stated a couple of times in interviews that if a man hits his wife, then it means that she deserved it. So why it's meaningful, because it was the first time this year when actually this statement of hers uh, created a public outcry and she had to publicly apologize for this opinion and, and um, she took some lessons, she learned and then she made a movie against uh, domestic violence. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing that people are changing and it's a, it's a beautiful thing that given us to forgive other people and forgive ourselves for our mistakes. So, and I, I totally loved what you said about pandemic that gave us this liberation moment because I remember when I was about to go on tour in North America in um, March and April, and actually this event had to happen at the time. Um, and all of a sudden it didn't happen. And um, at the time I still had my really, really rigid managers um, white man, <laughs> and they were so to say, yeah, we are supposed to, we are supposed to, I'm like, the whole world is not moving in the way how you suppose it to move, so let's just 
let's just improvise. And, you know, some people just don't get it, but I think people who are ready to embrace the unknown and um, move towards it, um, that they, they win the most in this year. Um, what did we talk about before? <laughs> <laughs> What was, the, what was the initial question? I think, because I had something to tell you, but I forgot what was the initial question. Mm -hmm. Just um, what are some of the lessons of oh. right now that, that, you know, we're learning so much. And so what do you yeah. want to take from right now into the future? Uh, we were completely dri <laughs> driven away. Um, so I can speak from my perspective, um, an, artist, um, an artist in lockdown. Um, before I was shy to do a lot of things, to work a lot of with green screen, to work alone in my studio, to record myself. And strangely, this time was really liberating to me. So I think I'm going to save it um, for later, even post pandemic times, because I'm a medic person and I'm all the time on the road somewhere, like as, as most of the artists. So sometimes before I was still waiting for a time to make an action or to record a political song to, and, and I, I, felt, I felt like I have to be physically in the same space with people. And now I can just um, do it on the road in my trailer or tour bus. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would definitely take that, uh, this lesson from pandemic. Excellent. Um, something that's coming up for me is as we're talking about um, shifting dynamics of power and liberation and digital tools is thinking about, you know, the, the paradoxical paradigm that technology presents, which is to say, you know, we're now very, we were already dependent on these platforms, but now we're, I mean, I would say maybe overly dependent on Facebook and YouTube and Google and Amazon and, you know, all of these services and everything that we're using all the time. And, and these are companies, these are large international companies that they, on one hand, they have a vested interest in hosting all, all of these discussions and, and all of these um, movements and the movement work because you know it, it's good for them to have it all happening on their platforms, but they're not necessarily vested and invested in the outcome. Right. And so, mm -hmm. and a lot of times their actual business practices interfere with the work we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really, you know, thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot, but I'm curious if you two have, have started to grapple with, you know, that paradigm, especially because so much of the, of the work that's happening online is, is really precious and, and also precarious because of the, the companies yeah. that, that facilitate it. It is the funkiest dynamic, <laughs> yeah, right? I just, I mean, I think the most recent example is there's this whole, I don't know if you've been, you probably have been following this thing about the, the, the Instagram algorithm has changed or something that happened with the Instagram algorithm. And, and so, and it's curious, right? Like, I don't want to like feed into wild conspiracy theories, but then it's really hard not to... <laughs> When I'm looking at the black creators that I know on Instagram, whose whose accounts accounts seem to be throttled some kind of way or blocked out some kind of way, or what they call shadow ban, these different things that happen, I put a post about our new um, platform that we just introduced, and they got it's like 600 likes or 300 likes or views or whatever. And I have a random picture of my brother's for his 50th birthday it has 6,000 likes, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and nobody knows my brother. There's nothing relevant about that, except that that's sort of the, the, the beat that I had, the pace that I had been like accustomed to. So why the change when we're putting up political stuff? Um, and we can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. and, and it does, there has definitely been a conversation definitely lately with, um, folks, movement folks that I'm, you know, in community with about what our alternatives are, right? We recognize, I mean, we're always going to, there's that movie that's out that everybody's watching, it, The Social Experiment. Dilemma. I haven't seen it yet. The Social Dilemma, sorry. Um, and I haven't seen it yet, but my girlfriend told me a lot and it keeps running through my head where they said something like, if you're not, if you're not the, if you don't own it, then you're the, you're the product, something like that. If you don't own it, then you're the product. I was like, oh, that thing sat on my chest to think like to, it shifted off of my thinking. Yeah, we are the product. They are shaping us, moving us, influencing us in major ways that we don't even know, you know, chasing us around the internet, 
like getting in our minds, burrowing in our minds that we need to buy things or um, setting up the algorithm so you see certain things but you don't see others. It worries me mm -hmm. um, because like we were saying, it is, these are amazing tools. I don't know about Amazon, but these social media has amazing tools for us that can be used in really positive ways. But I, even the alternatives are other digital platforms, right? And we don't have the technology to, I mean, you know, until we have somebody who is um, with this analysis that many of us share who would build something like that. And if they did, people probably wouldn't switch, right? You know, and they'd have like Black Book and people like, I don't want to be a glitter or something like that. Nobody's going to join that. <laughs> so I, I'm just, I'm really just restating it. I don't, I don't have a, I'm reflecting on it. I don't have a, like a solution, but I definitely recognize and I know it's a growing concern amongst movement folks, right? Like, what, what are we going to do at the end of the day? We have to, I think part of it is at the end of the day, we have to always remember this is not ours. We didn't build it. We don't own it. We don't control it. And as much as we can use it to our advantage, we have to, but you have to keep that in the front of your head. This is not ours. I think um, that we should demand actually that those big, data corporations, um, they would take in mind our um, vote when they make their decisions. Um, and um, th this is not happening right now at all, but I see this um, structure, like we are, we are the workers in the structure, we are providing them content and we should be co-owners. So in my mind, it could be solved through everyone who, own, who, who joins the social network and who given their work to this platform to co-own the company in a way and to have a vote about how the algorithm is going to be changed or it's not going to be changed. Um, because um, take a look at Facebook, it commercialized so crazily and let's take a look at Cambridge Analytica case. It's totally insane. And um, nobody can abandon this platform, especially if you, I mean, yeah, some people can abandon this platform, but like I personally spent years of my life working on this platform that I feel like I own, but I don't in fact. And I feel like it will require like mass people, global planetary movement to request from these companies that we should have some word about what's happening with our data, what's happening with our, um, labor that we're putting into these platforms and what's happening with um yeah our, our personal information mm. Mm. yeah thank you both for such thoughtful answers and i i'm a former tech reporter and so i it like keeps me awake at night like i think about it all the time <laughs> um, but you know i do think what you're both speaking to is really important you know it's it's we we make use of what's useful and then kind of try to push them towards better practices as much as possible and, and hold them accountable where we can, you know, and I've been thinking a lot about, um, to me, one of the things that I think kind of counteracts all the, all the worries that I have about social media, which is the potential for, you know, cross-cultural and cross-community solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, with, even just my introduction to Pussy Riot and coming in and, and in 2012 and becoming aware of the band and getting really like, I need to learn about what's going on in Russia and kind of making those connections, you know, to, um, you know, LGBTQAI work here and there and realizing, okay, I have to care about, I care about my community here and I have to care about that community in Russia. And um, same with, you know, Me Too and kind of just, just connecting all these dots on social media. And I think I'm, I'm interested in sort of, the potential for solidarity. And I, I think as much as we do battle with the algorithm, you know, even right now, there's so much awareness that is raised through social media. And I'm um, curious sort of how, if, if you still feel there's all this potential for solidarity or is it shifting even as we try to negotiate the things that might be drowning out messages potentially? Nadia, let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> Lately, um, I had the craziest problem with YouTube and Google. They were banning the name of our band because of the word pussy. Mm, wow. It was really, really awkward. So uh, and some of our videos were shadow banned and they, we, we couldn't get 
uh, you would not find them in search if you try to find. Uh, we solved it because we contacted the team of Google people, but again, not everyone mm -hmm. has the privilege of knowing those people. So yeah, that was, that was really, really awkward. Um, so minding all these constraints, I'm, I'm really positive. I'm really positive about global solidarity. Um, I, more than that, I think um, today we, as human species, we face global problems and the answer should be global as well. And uh, previous global organizations like the UN, they don't always make the best job. They're not, they're not solving all the problems that we have. And um, there, there should be something else that will arise from, from the ashes of previous organizations. And I think it should be built by people. It should be built by activists. So without global solidarity, we'll, we're not going to join, uh, we're not going to solve global problems like you know, warming planet or um, global inequality. Yeah, I, I, so again, the flip side, right? My, and, and to pick, um, kind of building on something I said earlier about like dreaming into our vision or living into our vision, that I, you know, when I was doing this work in my community and it started in Selma, Alabama, and then I did it in Philadelphia and some in New York, um, it was always grassroots community-based work, local young people or local adults and young people um, do, coming together to talk about and work around sexual violence in ways that I just didn't see happening in other social justice spaces um, in my community. When Me Too went viral, of course, it becomes this big global thing. But and at, at the end of the day, what I realized is that the people who said Me Too still need the same things, are still looking for and need the same things as those people in my community in the very grassroots level. And so one of the most beautiful and powerful things to come from the, the, the viral moment is that we have all of these Me Too's popping up in different countries. So over the last three years, I mean, India, Mexico, Australia, uh, Sw Sweden, various countries in Africa, South Africa, Rwanda, Ghana, uh, Ethiopia, we've been contacted by so many groups from across the world. So we're moving, we're doing global work now, right? We are, um, have expanded our work to meet the global need. That would be next to impossible without social media, right? And the, and the thing that makes that, that talking about this, this solidarity, so now we have the opportunity to come in and convene these groups from different parts of the world and they're all grassroots. It's not like, like you were talking, it's not like the UN Council on so-and-so or the global da 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 whatever. These are groups of people in a country who started a hashtag and other people use that hashtag. Then they contacted each other through back channels using social media. A lot of places, Me Too China, I thought had one of the most subversive and brilliant strategies around that you couldn't put hashtag me too up on and on the internet in China. So what they did was they used two emojis, a little bunny and a little bowl of rice because the bunny, the word was M I like me and the rice was T U like, you know, two brilliant. That's just brilliant. Like every time I think about it, I'm just like, people going to get their message across. People going to, you cannot <laughs> stop movement. You really can't, it's, it's just like once it gets going. So I do think despite the algorithms and the big business and the blah, 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 there is a solidarity that has built and is still growing across the world. And it, it would be next to impossible to, to um, connect with those folks, mm -hmm. if not for these, for these you know, um, outlets to do that. So you know, we're going to stay. So we're going to stay, <laughs> right? And we're going to, to, like you said, Nadia, push them as much as we can because, I mean, that's the nature of what we do anyway, right? We push back against any form of somebody trying to, to oppress in, in any kind of way. So we'll stay and we'll fight and we'll complain and we'll talk loud on those same platforms about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we'll make some progress in moving them um, because there is still a reality of, like, you know, you were talking about ownership, people, um, public um, perception, there still has some cachet, 
right? And so you don't want to be known. People are leaving Facebook in droves, even though Instagram is the same, same company, excuse me, but they're leaving Facebook in droves. I hear it all the time. Oh, I don't even go on Facebook anymore um, because of the perception, right? If you, this country is in the state that it's in and you play a role in advancing that, I don't want anything to do with you. So, uh, you know, I think they have to respond to that at some point. Mm, mm. It better. They it better. <laughs> exactly. Bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to go into audience questions in just a moment. Um, and so I'm going to look over and see what was submitted. And while I'm doing that, um, I wanted to hear you both just reflect on if you were interested on... Um, <laughs> You know, just how do you sustain long term? Because I think right now we're hearing a lot of people talk about burnout and protest fatigue. Mm -hmm. And you both have been organizing and activist since you were teenagers. And so, you know, how do you sustain that over the years? What are your tips for longevity and caretaking? Now you want to go? <laughs> yeah. Um, first thing that we discussed before joy if you know how to combine joy and activism it will last longer the second is community community gives the biggest strength and gives it's the biggest source of courage to me because when i'm surrounded by amazing um courageous women i don't feel like backing up and um mm -hmm. not doing my work as an activist um, we support each other, we encourage each other to make actions, but also we support each other if you feel like, you know, we are tired and we need some break. So um, empathy and community work uh, is, is a really big sort of, um, source for me of my long-term activism. Um, and in the end of the story, just do what you love. I think this is the universal answer. And not expect things to change tomorrow um, um, because I, I see it in a lot of people who just come to activism I saw it a lot uh, in in people who joined women's march and who became activists for the first time right after Donald Trump was elected in the United States and uh, right after women's march I saw so many people who were burned out because they thought if they're going to make this effort and make this big giant amazing action then Donald Trump will be gone but uh, unfortunately that's not how it works in activism somehow sometimes you work for years and for dozens of years and nothing is changing and sometimes things magically change when you literally don't do anything so it's more like magic it's not it's not that big, you know, <laughs> activism doesn't work as a capitalist economy it's not like I'm giving you a dollar and you give me an apple <laughs> it's wow. it's economy of magic yes. it's economy of gift <laughs> I love that. I, it's the same thing we say about it's not transactional. Like, yes, I, it is. I think, you know, I want these young people who are getting into movement work now to learn lessons from those of us who've been in it for a long time. And, um, and I also want them to study. I want them to, to, to learn and take some, take some time to invest in um, understanding successful and unsuccessful movements over, you know, the history of time. But in terms of, you know, being sustained, I, I, I absolutely get this question a lot, right? And people ask because of the nature of the work, how do you listen to people's stories and things like that? I, you know, I always say my number one self-care practice is boundaries, right? Before anything else, I have a very comfortable relationship with the word no. I'm, you know, I was fortunately raised by a mother who said on a regular basis, and I would say, can I ask you a question? She's like, go ahead, you got a 50-50 shot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was raised to be comfortable with hearing no, and I'm, I was also raised to be comfortable with saying no. Um, and, and that's been really, really helpful for me because I lose, you know, you lose it sometimes. You start feeling pressured and you, you're, you're, you're a public figure now. People need, this person needs you, me. And they use that word need. And that's not a real, that's not real. You don't actually need me because I'm not helping you breathe. I'm not paying your rent, right? I'm not carrying you to work. You don't need me. <laughs> um, so that's part of my, the, the practice was just, that I use to sustain myself. And I tell that to other young people because there is this culture of martyrdom. And, um, and, and I tell a lot of stories, but there was one of the most impactful stories to me about this was 
I, I had an opportunity to, to, to spend some time with Toni Morrison. And we had like a private, the, the author, and the, we had a private session with her and some young people. And I brought my daughter, of course. And my daughter asked about, um, not Brown, about writer's block. I mean, what do you do when you really feel like blocked and you can't write anymore? And she said, I don't believe in writer's block. There's no such thing. If, you, if you're blocked, you're supposed to be blocked. And she mm-hmm. said, what she tells her students is you have, it's, it's, it's sort of God's way of telling you to pause and you have to respect the pause. So if you feel burnt out in this work, then I think it is more, it is actually more beneficial to the movement for you to take a step back. Because when you find your passion, it is always gonna call you back home. So there's not, there's no risk of you leaving the work for a little while and then, and then never doing it again. Then you're not supposed to be here. There's another path for you. But if you feel so burnt out that you can't, oh, I can't go to another march. I can't watch another, don't, don't. It is also action. It is also a, a, a liberation practice to take care of yourself, right? And we need people who are fully actualized human beings, who feel joy, who feel worthy, who feel not burnt out in the world to be examples of the world that we wanna get to. Mm -hmm. So it's fine to take a step back from this work. It's fine to, to, to I think it's actually a privilege to recognize when when it's burnout. Because when you recognize that, then you have the opportunity to say, you know what? A little bit of self-assessment, I'm gonna take a break from this. Right. I've moved away from this work on many occasions. <laughs> and some of it, some of it is just like the thing that we don't talk about is this thing, this doesn't pay. Right. When nobody is in liberation work to get to get paid, I get paid for like speaking engagements and stuff now. But up until three years ago, I had a regular ass salary and I got a kid in college and I got, you know, so and and prior to, you know, I'm grown now and I've had a lot of experience so I can get these higher level jobs. But my, the majority of my life was spent working in nonprofit organizations, making way less than scale, way less than whatever the market rate was. And so financially, sometimes I had to take a step back. So if I'm spending, if I'm working every day on this little bitty nonprofit salary and after work, I'm organizing, doing this, volunteering here, got these groups, I had to take a break because I couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. We don't talk often enough about that, I think, right? Like there's a lot of people, I have particularly women of color who are volunteering right now, volunteering at the polls, driving people to the polls, registering people to vote, doing all this extra work they're not getting paid for. So whatever practice you have to do to take care of yourself, I am all for that. I, I consider that movement work. And, and I think that we have to respect however people need to show up in the moment. Mm. I, I, could listen to you too. I could listen to you two all night. I'm just like taking it all in. It's so good. Um, okay. So we have some incredible audience questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted. Um, this one I think is really powerful. And so thank you to whoever submitted it. Uh, it is. We've been talking a lot about the online space, but can you talk about the implications of movement work on your bodies from arrest to incarceration, to stress, et cetera? It seems that no how uh, sorry. It seems that no matter how virtual it gets, our bodies are still on the line. That's right. It's true. It's it's true. I mean, I you know, <laughs> I have. I'm 47, and I think it was it was it was not. I think I know it was in 2014 after Mike Brown, when you know people were taken to the street again in protest, and I was out there. I was marching with my daughter. My daughter was in high school at the time. I remember making a very conscious decision that I wasn't doing this no more. I have, I just, I can't, like I physically cannot do this anymore. I have been out here marching in the rain till I'm cold and sick. I have been, you know, like all these kind of things and I had to figure out another way to show up. So I'm gonna train the kids. I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a donate to the cause. I'm gonna volunteer some, you know, some other way. But I think that's very, another very real thing that we don't talk about. I, and And, even though I've been, I've been arrested, I've been in all these kind of really some scary situations. When it came to my daughter, I was like, don't you go out there and get arrested. <laughs> because I know the toll that it takes. And I and I, my instinct is to protect my, my child, right? And so um, 
Yeah, I do think we have to be really cognizant of, of that. And some of the, the, the resources that we provide as support for folks in movement should also take that into account, the effects mm -hmm. it has on your body. We need more to infuse more healing work, um, more trauma work, because it is, it is, we can, it, they glamorize it on TV. It is not fun being arrested. It is not fun being pushed in a huge crowd by, of people by the police. It is not fun being gassed, right? You may have stories to tell later, but in that moment and them six months after, that thing will haunt you and will do something to you. And so I think we also have to be very clear and honest about that, not glamorize it and make it like a badge of honor for folks and not prepare them for what that will actually do to them. Like that's really real. Yeah, um, I was um, I was that person who did not care about my mental health uh, mm -hmm. until the moment when right after I was released from jail, I found myself in a bleak reality and I could not understand what's happening because nothing gave me pleasure. I didn't, I was not motivated. I was still working. I was still doing my organizing job and I was uh, making, uh, working an alternative media outlet that, that would provide independent news for Russian citizens. It was in 2014, but none of the work would give me any happiness. And then I had to admit to myself, uh, I was 25 at the moment, that actually mental health matters. And I had to go to doctors and they prescribed me antidepressants and you know it's a longer conversation of whether we should or not should not take antidepressants but i i think for a lot of activists um it's a common problem we don't we don't think about um we don't care about ourselves enough um another problem that i personally enco encountered being a young activist I was paying so much attention on my mind and my, on my actions, I would completely neglect my body. It did not exist. Um, I would not exercise. I would not, I know, do what I want. I know, lay down when I want. I would just be totally consumed by saying that the project that I'm doing right now. And I thought, I mean, I have resources um, and, you know, I, I'm not falling down. So it means that I still can work. So then, strangely enough, jail taught me how to um, how to get some pleasure, including bodily bodily pleasure, pleasure oh pleasures from life. And I really hope that you guys who listen to it, you don't have to go to jail to learn how to <laughs> take care of your body and take care of your mental health. You can find better ways how to do it. Yeah, but um, prison is not fun. And yeah, so this. Uh, I, I totally understand what you uh, talk about, that people do glamorize it. So when I got out of jail, I, I felt so awkward because I actually was traumatized. I was like relieving my uh, trauma in nightmares every day. And, and, and people treated me as a celebrity at the time. So I didn't feel like that at all. I felt like people talk with someone else who was behind my back, but not with me. So <laughs> it was a really weird um uh, weird um, experience. So, yeah, take care of yourself and take care of people around you. You are performing really, really difficult job. Excellent. There's another question, and it is: How can women more readily uh, recognize and combat internalized sexism and the way it interferes in the way women perceive and treat each other? And related to that is how should women resist patriarchal manipulation? And I, I love this question. I'm just going to expand it to beyond women because I think all people need to learn, you know, how to think about dominant culture and dominant society. So men can learn from that too and non-binary folks. But I still think this is an incredible question. I'd, I'd love to hear you both answer it. Yeah, I, I think about just this idea of internalized sexism or just, you know, the thing that I hear, one of the things I hear them a lot from folks, especially young people on college campus and stuff is that, you know, they ask me things like, don't you think that if all men would just change that the world, we'd, we'd be rid of this problem, right? There'd be no need to if men would just stop and change. And I'm like, that is, and let me, let me disabuse you of that notion <laughs> now, right? Because we are, and I, and I usually go back to them and ask them questions like, you know, I said, you heard me say earlier that 
we have to dismantle rape culture because rape culture creates the the the, um, the space for violence to happen. Right? Mm. And if you don't think you contribute to rape culture, then we'll never undo that. Like think about how many times you called call a girl a slut randomly to your friends because she had a certain thing or she liked the guy or you heard a rumor or whatever. It's like that is the same as the as the guy who says the crude things when you walk by, right? This is not about what men have to do. And I think one of the real mistakes of this of this moment has been only engaging men from the perspective of harm doers and and perpetrators, right? Yes. And and not really taking a look at the way uh, sexual violence is perpetrated by all people that not just people who identify as women experience sexual violence. And we all have something, we have all contributed, no matter what position you take in this movement to, to patriarchal society. And so yes. I think that to answer the question that when you have that, if you have the wherewithal to understand and to ask that question, then you have the ability to be intentional about doing something about it. I think part of it is that a lot of people just don't even have the presence of mind to understand that it is internalized. We've all been socialized in a sexist patriarchal society, all of us. We've all been socialized to think in the binary and only and think about particular roles for particular people. There has to be a, a, a massive unlearning, a massive re-socialization in order for us to see the kind of shift that we want. And that's not gonna happen. I think, you know, in some ways for the older generation, it is incredibly difficult. But for those of, you know, they, you know the saying, if you know better, you do better. So if you know enough to ask that question, then you have to go out and seek the, 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 the information that you need. There are books to read, people to talk to, podcasts to listen to, you know, information, uh, um, topics to, to be um, brought up to speed on, be intentional, and then share that information. Start having those conversations in your inner circles. Start using words like internalized sexism and see what kind of see what that sparks amongst your feminist friends. You know, mm -hmm. I just I just think that's the way we have to move. And look at yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I look within myself, and um, I I have to admit that over the years I had to relearn a lot of stuff and uh, rework the way my psychology works because it just it's, it's, it's impossible to live in society and not be affected by it. So I, there was a moment in my life when I was identifying myself as a feminist, but at the same time, I was still um, treating other women as competitors, first of all. And there is a simple explanation for that. I mean, like for, for years, for, for thousands of years, we were dependent on the approval of men and they were the only ones who would give us any resources that we may have and they would easily take it away from us so it makes sense that maybe at some point women were our competitors but it doesn't have to be that way anymore like we're our own people and there is such a beauty that um i as i was growing up i was opening my eyes on the beauty of sisterhood and um now to me it's the biggest treasure so it's not just moral imperative. So it's not, it's, there, is, there is joy in that as well because the whole world will open up for you and it will have much more colors than it, you used to have uh, when you lived with this internalized sexism. Oh, you two are so brilliant. I, I really <laughs> wish we had all night to talk. <laughs> but I, I wanna thank you both for your energy and your time and just clarity and transparency and vulnerability. And I really felt the presence, even though we're in this digital environment, I really, really appreciate everything you two brought tonight. So I wanna say thank you again for chatting with me and with the Baltimore Museum of Art. Uh, and thank you to everyone you. who tuned in as well. Oh, thank you. I'm just like, I've been taking notes the whole time. So I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you are, you're a really great moderator. I love when moderators oh. can listen to what's here, you know, happening and kind of pivot and act and go deeper and know when to do that. So thank you. This is a great, it makes it a great conversation. Mm, it's my honor, like <laughs> highlight of my week, my month. And I'm going to hand it back over to Kim, who's going to take it from here and let you know what's coming next. Thank you, Jenna. I, I feel so lifted by this fantastic conversation between the three of you. Uh, Nadia dropped gems, 
But when Tarana said, my self-care is boundaries, that was a whole mood. And Jenna, you did a fabulous job moderating, so thank you all. Tonight's program was generously sponsored by Susanna F. Cohen and the Cohen Opportunity Fund. Thank you so much for your support. Special thanks again to our amazing guests, Tarana Burke, Nadia Tolokonikova, and Jenna Wortham for delivering such an inspiring conversation. I got a lot out of it. I'm sure you did too. I'm your host, Kim Brown. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Have a great night.